Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Payne. I'm a platform engineer at AirMap. This talk taming, uh, is on taming stringly typed APIs with one neat trick. This is um, a project that I did uh, for a company called Meteomatics. It's not something I did at work. It's, um, they have a very cool weather forecasting system. Uh, they've been around for about uh, six years, based in St. Gallen. They do high precision weather forecasts, and they have a nice HTTP API, which we'll talk about. Um, I know the founder vaguely. They have a lot of API, um, client libraries for different uh, languages. They didn't have a Go one, so I spent a weekend to write them a Go client library, which is open source at that URL. They do weather forecasting. How does weather forecasting work? You get some observation data, you feed it into your numerical weather model, and out pops your forecast. Where you get the data from really makes a big difference to the quality of your, uh, your forecast. There's all sorts of ways in which we gather um, weather information at the moment. Um, they're on the slide here. But what's particularly tricky is what's called the physical boundary layer, which is stuff from ground level up to about uh, 1,500 meters. And the only way we really have to do it at the moment is weather balloons. These are very expensive. You, you strap basically a bunch of sensors, um, which is this box here, to, to a helium-filled balloon. Um, it flights up during the through the atmosphere. Eventually, it gets to about 100 kilometers where it bur the balloon bursts. This little green thing is a parachute that pops open and the sensor box uh, lands somewhere. You know, no idea where. You get about one in five of these things back. They're so expensive that in Switzerland, um, you only get two launched per day, one at midday, one at, um, at midnight from Payern. So this, this lower level here is very hard to get data, and it really has a lot of effect on the weather that we actually get, um, particularly when it's for low, low effects, low stratus, fog, where the storm's actually going to happen. Get not. So how can we get better data here? Um, last year, the answer would have been uh, blockchain. This year, the answer is, of course, drones. <laughs> so... <laughs> They, they've, uh, Meteomatics have brought these cool, really cool little drones. They've got, there's a lot of that red thing is a, a deployment parachute in case something goes wrong. Um, it's full of, uh, full of sensors. Uh, they're working on techniques to be able to get these things to fly safely in, uh, in clouds and fog. One of the problems that drones have at the moment is if you fly it and it's sort of cold and a bit wet, you get icing on the propellers. They're no longer propellers and your drone falls out of the sky. Um, these things you can launch multiple times. They built a meteor base. This is one of these drones. This is sitting on a like basically an automatic recharging pod. The drone launches, flies up, does its mission, it gathers the data, comes back, lands on the pod, and a few minutes later is ready to fly again. What you get a result is that instead of just getting two samples of the atmosphere per day, you can get a sample every 30 minutes. This is example data from one of the drones. You've got time on the horizontal axis, altitude on the vertical, and these white dotted lines are the actual drone flights, drone launches. Samples, here it's, we're showing temperature, lands, samples on the way down, and relaunches a bit later. This is uh, one evening in 2017, which is quite interesting. You can see things are cooling up at high atmosphere. This is the beginning of the formation of the ground inversion um, lower down. This gives you much better data to put into your weather model, and consequently much better short-term forecasts. But this is going to talk about Go, not weather. Um, this is particularly about stringly typed APIs. For those who don't know, a stringly typed API is a play on strongly typed. It's basically where everything is a string. Um, this is what the current Meteomatics API looks like. It's an HTTP GET request. In there, there are um, three key parameters, time, parameters of location, when you want the forecast for, what you want, and whereabouts you want it for. In response, you get different structures, a point response for a single um, Example here, temperature at noon uh, tomorrow, a one-dimensional response, something evolving over time or space, or even a two-dimensional um, response, or like uh, a whole, uh, give me all of switch and show me solar radiation or whatever. Um, these things go into, they're into the URL, and everything is a string. These are example time values here. There's lots of different formats for these strings, uh, expressing different, uh, uh, well, different uh, types of time, what you want. Uh, similarly, for the parameters, the, the different weather data that you want and the units you want it in and the altitude that you want it measured at, you're all expressed in this way and end up as a string. And finally, for location as well, you've got everything from single latitude, longitude points to grids with n by n points or a point every 0.1 degrees. Um, you can do stuff along a path, put in postcodes for different countries. There's a whole load of stuff here. 
So I want to say that this is actually, they've got a really nice API here. Everything they've done is very consistent, it's very powerful and expressive, it's unambiguous, it's easy to type in at your um, uh, at curl, and it's very human readable, that way you're getting. But we're gonna write a Go um, client library for this. The first attempt looks like this. We wanna send a request to be asked time, parameters, and location as all three as strings. This is what an example request might look like for getting the, uh, the temperature two meters above the ground, uh, 12 hours from now in Zurich. This, however, has quite a lot of weaknesses. Uh, there's a nice blog post by Dave Cheney that you might have read to be aware of functions which take several parameters of the same type. This API is uh, easy to misuse. Uh, we have no type checking here. We get the order of parameters wrong. We get no warnings from the compiler. Um, we'll, we'll find out later when we get error message from, our, um, from the server. Um, there's no assistance in creating these fairly complex strings. There's no type checking. Um, this is not a great API. Can we do better? And the answer is yes, with Go interfaces to the rescue. So I'll look into the detail of time, but equally it applies to uh, location parameters. Let's define a new type. It's a two-type declaration and a new interface that allows us to get things in this form. Now, we can create constants for these shortcuts like now and define a interface, uh, define that this type, this time string type, implements the time stringer interface. There's a lot of stutter there, but don't worry, this doesn't appear to the users of the API. But this, that's a trivial example with a fixed string, but we can do something more sophisticated. If you want to use a normal go time.time .time type, we can declare our own type that uh, has, is the same sort of values and we can declare that that implements our time string interface. And here we're taking a go time.time .time and we're formatting it according to the form, um, format required by the Metamatics API. Of course, we can get more sophisticated than this. This is a now plus some time where we get a, a duration is our, our basic uh, offset. And now there's a bit more logic as to work out, um, is it even number of hours or minutes uh, or seconds that from now? All of these things implement the time stringer interface. In fact, we've got a whole range of types now that implement this, and these are all written in using normal Go, uh, Go types. Uh, similarly, we do exactly the same thing with location. Here's a, uh, some of the example locations that we use. And this, using these, this is what our new API is, uh, looks like. Instead of three different string parameters, we've got three, we take three different interfaces, and this is what using our API looks like. And you can see now it's much more fluent. We get to use um, high-level Go uh, structs, um, which um, the first one is a type conversion for a time dot duration into a, uh, into a now offset. The second one is a struct, uh, which happens to implement the, the parameter string of type. And the last one is another Go struct, which implements the location uh, string it. Time. Now, what have we achieved by doing this? So, what we've done is we've replaced our string arguments with type specific interfaces. Our API is now strongly typed. The Go compiler will catch it if anything is out of place or the wrong way around or cannot be converted. We get a much more literal, uh, much more easy to read structured values that we can use. And interesting, the conversions are now automatically done by Go at runtime. We are no longer creating the strings ourselves, the Go runtime will say, okay, I've got a time stringer, I'll call the time string uh, method on it, and I'll get the string uh, back myself. We, as users, don't have to worry. These, these conversions are automatic. The complexity of the construction is hidden from the user. We can give these nice high-level um, structural types, and um, all any advanced logic required to turn that into a string is fully transparent to the user of the um, uh, of the library. And despite this um, uh, specialization with time stringer, location stringer, param stringer interfaces, our API remains extensible. We can, uh, users can create their own values that implement the same interfaces. And if necessary, you can always fall back to using a time string, uh, using uh, a type new time string constructor with whatever you want in it. That's it. That is taming um, stringly typed interfaces uh, APIs with one neat trick. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you had two key, key elements that you defined. One was the time string or interface, mm -hmm. and one was the time string type. Yes. And could you explain the purpose of the type? I didn't quite understand that. Yes, uh, good my... question. So we could, um, so this is the first one is the type definition, the second one is the interface. We could just um, replace in the interface the returned value of time string with being just a string. The trouble is, then um, it gets easier to mix up things between the different types. By explicitly, this is part one. You get you. Um, so this means that we um, uh, we basically we get a bit more type checking this way. The second uh, case is we want to be able to, have, be able to declare fairly sort of constant literal values that implement our type stringer interface. So we need a type string type anyway. So why not use it as the return type from the uh, from the method and the interface? Okay. Thank you very much. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions anywhere? So, oh, thank you very much, Adi.